I always feel really shy when I'm in front of a non-baseball crowd and people ask me about baseball stuff or talk about me as a baseball thing, especially because we're not in a place that I did very well, so I'm just gonna throw that out there. I'll just, I'll just hang myself right on that. Um, so a couple, I guess it was a couple months ago, um, Edward uh, hit me up and he said, hey, it'd be cool if you could come out to Bitcoin Day. And I said, I love Bitcoin, that's great. Will there be, will there be hamburgers there or something? Like, what's the deal? Um, and he said, oh, we want you to give a talk. I said, okay, let me think about something. And on, off the top of my head, I said, I'm gonna do payments as a vote. And I'm like, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> Shit. Uh, so anyway, so we're gonna talk about a couple things. First of all, just a little background on this. My journey into Bitcoin, uh, in 2013, 2014, I originally heard about Bitcoin. I was at the time uh, a gold bug, and I had done really well in the sort of fear cycle and the, the economic meltdown of 2007 to 2009. Um, I, uh, my mom was a realtor, so I was like, I understood hard money and hard assets and things like that, and I understood gold. And when I heard about Bitcoin, I was like, this magic internet money stuff? Like, this sounds like such a scam. And then Mt. Gox happened, and I was like, totally a scam. And then uh, Silk Road happened, and I was like, ew, gosh, bad people using Bitcoin. I can't get involved in this. So I literally didn't think about it for a couple years. And then when, when number number go up is really the thing that brings everybody in, it's, it's what everybody notices. They see the velocity and the volatility of an asset going upwards, and they're like, wow, this is amazing, like how do I participate in this? I looked at it and I said, I remember the last couple times I had an opinion on this, and I dug my heels in, and I didn't participate, and Bitcoin went up, and I said, this is too quick, I've seen this before, and it came right back down, and I was like, ha, suckers! So no offense to anybody in here, but that's how I felt. And, uh, but it didn't go to zero, and I was so fascinated by that. I was so fascinated how this asset could go like maximal parabolic and then just slam down and then find an equilibrium, you know, in the sort of three, 4,000 range. So, and that's when I jumped in. I, I didn't know about the 21 million limit. That was the thing, because I didn't have any friends that were Bitcoiners. None of my people that had talked to me about that, they were all like, you know, they weren't people that, that I was really in my circle. I'm not a computer programming guy, I'm, I can't read you know, Python or program Rust or anything like that. So it wasn't something I was able to really like self audit. Um, so it really was, uh, for me initially, uh, I got into Bitcoin because it's a 24 seven market. And I felt like as a day trader, it was something that I could get involved in and find a way, you know, to, to make it make it mine. Um, but you know, as with everybody in Bitcoin, I think you, go, you get there initially, you show up and you say, I'm here because I want to make money. I'm here because I want to increase my wealth, or I want to I want to increase my financial safety, or you know, hedge against inflation, or whatever. And then you start learning and meeting all the people behind it, and you're like, this is a revolution. These people get it. This is a different thing. This is, you know, I mean, here I have to follow, you know, the film from Swan. I have to like leave the room because I'm like, I just can't. I can't process the baby lambs right now, Brady. God damn it. You know what I mean? I can't think about that. I gotta get my game face on. You know what I mean? And I, it, because I'm at the point now as a believer, you know, I've been in it for a couple years, not as long as some people, but longer than others. You know, but I do a lot of the work on it. I've, I've, I've read all the books. I've met a lot of people. I've, I've tried to learn how to read the code and stuff like that to like audit it and see if I like it, see if I understand what's happening. You know, there's some things in there like the, the 21 million limit is literally baked in there. It's like five lines. Jameson Lop tweeted it out recently, and it was kind of funny. He was like dunking on, you know, uh, people like Schiff or whoever else say that like, oh, how do you know it's limited? Um, so anyways, payments is a vote. This is what we're talking about. How we spend our money determines what is going to happen with the network. That's the reality, okay? Um, so we're going to, uh, we're gonna talk about the state of your Satoshis, the current status of your, you know, you got all these things, we're all over the place. We're stacking, we're hodling, we're trading, we're, we're paying, we're DCAing, we're, it's everywhere, right? But what happens is, you know, eventually you start, you start moving your priorities and you figure out, you know what, I need to get these things aligned. I need to figure out how to, how to get my, my life in a straight line. You can see I have this little animation here going for everybody. You know, people are trading, they're stacking, they're, they're trading to get more, they're figuring that out. It just depends on really where you're at in that, in that continuum um, of, I guess, you know, uh, emotional ability or whatever. You see DCA basically comes in and just wipes out trading for a lot of people. A lot of people come in and they, and they start as a trader, they think, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be so good, oh my gosh, and then they're like, 
Coinbase charges three dollar minimum. What the fuck? And then they stop doing that and they just start stacking. Uh, and they sign up with Swan, which is great. Um, and then you know you start figuring out, hey, I want to get paid to support my stack. Okay, I want someone to pay me in Bitcoin now. Now you get creative. Now you see Strike just comes out with a thing that says pay me in Bitcoin, right? Uh, Aaron Rodgers just comes out and says, I'm going to get paid in Bitcoin. I'm like, damn it, I wish I would have figured this shit out when I was making a lot of money as a baseball player. It would have been really lucrative, you know? Um, but, you know, it's important. This is the key, though, right? You need to know where your sats are at, right? And I think that's something that there's all these different vendors, all these different companies, and we're going to talk about why it's important to support the ones that are doing you right, because there's there's some really great companies out there, but it's up to us to take this revolution to the next step. Right now, uh, the question is, what's the what's the current worldwide population using Bitcoin? Do I have any? any? 2%. Okay, someone saw my slide already. Okay. So, so we're at about 150, 160 million users worldwide, okay, for Bitcoin. It's a very, like, so when people say, like, oh, Bitcoin's 60 grand, it's so expensive. It's like, this is the best representation that we're still early. I mean, realistically, right? We all know how many people live in the world. And then if this is all, this is all we have so far, we have a long runway to go. And that's very important because we need to come up with a vision, right? Our vision of what is the future. Obviously, like, Bitcoin is generational wealth. The film lays it all out there, right? So it's like actually kind of a treat to be able to follow that because I'm like, hey, they already said it. I just have to repeat it. Um, you know, but what is our focus during this process while we're ramping up? That's the real question. And then you get to the you get to the next question, which is, how much am I worth? Okay, and this is a very fundamental question. It's just as fundamental as what is money. Okay, listening to Adam talk about Bitcoin and mining and stuff like that, you know, how much is your natural gas worth? How much is your electricity worth? How much is your power worth? How much is your time worth? How much is your money actually worth? Think about your buying power. How many ham how many hamburgers can you buy if you were to divide your hourly wage? Like how many hamburgers per hour are you being paid in? Or you know, or mattresses, or visits to the dentist, or whatever. Like these tangible things. Like what is what is your relation to that? Because the fact that there's more millionaires now than ever is irrelevant if it costs you more money to buy a house. Because and the, the theft of inflation along those along those lines is. How much more taxes are you paying? And sales tax, property tax, all this other stuff because your assets are being inflated from underneath you. We don't really necessarily want to have our assets inflate. It doesn't really benefit us, okay? This is the biggest fallacy that's in the mainstream media when they talk about what's happening in finances today. Oh, my Tesla stock's up, or my Apple stock's up, or my house is worth 30% more. Well, it's like, so is everybody else's. You're not winning, okay? <laughs> Only people that are making asymmetric bets by placing their personal wealth into Bitcoin are providing a future ramp for success, okay? Um, if I lose anybody, stop me, okay? I'm gonna steamroll through this just because I'm a little bit nervous. Um, this is like, you know, that now, like how much more than Satoshi's, right? Thinking about how to how to calculate your life, like we just did, so Nelly said 20 bucks, right? 20 bucks worth of Bitcoin, and Brady and I are like, 32,000, 35,000. Like, you know, like you, when you get into this deep enough, you start to literally be able to look at it and calculate it in your head. It's just like having the exchange rate for the pound right before you go to Europe or something like that. And you know, I am gonna spend euros or spend pounds. I need to know what my buying power is, or what my earning power really is. And one of the best things about Swan, throwing this out there, is you can actually denominate your stack in sats, like the full thing. So you can say, oh, I'm a Satoshi whatever, millionaire or you know, decamillionaire or something like that. The goal, of course, is to get as many people in our lives so everybody has Bitcoin in here. We can start with that. I'm going to start drilling everybody. Upset. Okay. Upset. Hey, whatever. Is, 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 is everybody not? Is everybody not scared of Bitcoin? I guess. How about that one? Is everybody in here not scared of owning Bitcoin? Okay, there you go. All right. So, so then the next step is how many of the people that I care about, and what's my network? How many of my how many people in my network as a percentage basis? How many of them are Bitcoiners, right? And and who am I helping? as I'm lifting them out of the, the sort of the fiat rat race into the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin magnetron. Um, and, you know, the, the, the thing is that you really are the, you are the sum of your choices, okay? And that's, that, that gets into a really big fundamental building block of everything you do as a habit. Okay, we think about this like fitness or diet or whatever else, but also in the way you spend, okay? 
So everybody that you are supporting, they're going to survive. They're going to make it. You know, GMI or NGMI, right? So you have to you have to put people into that category. What really really grinds my gears is when people say, "Oh, I'm so sick of Amazon. I'm so sick of this." And I'm like, "Oh, where'd you get that?" And they're like, "Amazon." Yeah. Don't fucking support Amazon if you have a problem with them. Okay. Don't support Tesla if you have a problem with them. Don't support Apple if you have a problem with them. Okay. You have to vote with your dollars and your sats and your life and your time. That is really important because we are experiencing a renaissance right now, and if you're putting ammunition in the gun of the enemy, then that's, that's hurting all of us in, you know, in the long run. You have to really, really uh, think about that and take conscious steps. One of the things I do when I talk to kids, you know, I talk to kids a lot about like making it as an athlete or whatever, and I say, okay, just visualize it this way, right? Here you are today, and like that's where you want to go. So all you have to do is take little steps, and you just stay focused on your goal. You just keep going, and eventually you look back. Oh, that was a little, okay. Here I go. Keep going, and you make a big, big difference just by staying on the same heading the whole way. So as a group, if we are Bitcoiners believing in a Bitcoin hyper Bitcoinized world, we have to all head that way. That's the key. Okay. So every step you take. Every breath you take, I'll be stacking with you. Okay, that's the key. So um, I'm not singing. I'll sing it later in karaoke if we have karaoke. I don't know what's the thing. But it's the steps that you take and, the, and and the payments that you make that really determine who wins. Okay, so you guys all have winners in your head. You all know who you who you want to win, right? And so the question is like, what's what is your role? What is your role in the revolution? Okay, what how, what are you going to do to make the world a better place? You know, to make your family a intergenerational family that can survive for hundreds of years throughout, or thousands of years, or you know, if you guys are watching Foundation on TV, maybe figure out some sort of weird genetic dynasty or something like that. There's a lot of different options out there. Okay, but the goal is you got to take charge and you got to take accountability. That's what Bitcoin's all about. Bitcoin is about taking accountability because you can't get it back easily. You can't go get like a, a super like 1.99 APR Bitcoin loan. Like that doesn't. That's not a thing. It's never going to be a thing because like Sailor will take it all. Okay, <laughs> that never is out there. He will take it all. He won't leave any Bitcoin for anybody else. And that's the game that we're in right now, right? So just just take conscious action. Sometimes that means taking a little bit more time analyzing and doing a cost benefit analysis. Bob is a guitarist, okay? Bob and I worked together for a long time, and I know when Bob got into Bitcoin in, in like a while ago, I'm just saying that, um, you know, it like now he can afford cooler guitars, okay? So that's just a good way of putting it. Uh, there's companies out there like Unchained, uh, Unchained Capital, uh, which is, they, they allow you to, to borrow against your Bitcoin. Now Coinbase is doing that. So you don't even have to sell your Bitcoin anymore. If you have a fiat job that's paying you and you're mining fiat on a monthly basis, then you can sort of like do this incredibly different algebra now because you can say, oh, well, if my stack is X and I want it to go to X plus 3% or 10% or whatever this year, whatever it is, Bitcoin's obviously getting more expensive as we go, so it's harder to stack in that regard, you know, towards like a full coin or 10 coins or whatever it is that you want to sailor into. But the, the thing is, if you can, if you can just keep taking steps and just keep moving forward and allow that pain of austerity every once in a while, like skipping on the thing that you used to maybe habitually purchase for yourself or experience, you will be so much better off three years from now, four years from now, you know, if you go that way. So we're gonna vote with our wallet, right? We're starting off, I'm, I got the memes up here now, so we gotta think about this, right? We, you know, we think it's funny, right? We're gonna have fun staying poor, we got all this stuff that we're, you know, we're clowning on Schiff or Nuria or Beanie or, you know, uh, Who's that chick, uh, Tasha or whatever? I think she's an economist now. That's great. Um, but so one one thing you can do, right, is is now now you put some impetus to it. And what if you had to, What if we really had to live the Bitcoin the Bitcoin way? If we if we moved into a virtual country that just only accepted Bitcoin, we have to transfer our everyday expenses with Bitcoin. So now, like four of us go to lunch, and you know somebody pays with their credit card, then that person says, okay, everybody's got to send me twenty bucks for the Bitcoin. We all know what to do. You open up Strike or you open up Cash App and you send that person 20 bucks. That's very simple, worth of Bitcoin. And then you turn right around and you buy 20 bucks of the Bitcoin. You're like, no Satoshis will escape my wallet, right? 
But you can do that. You can live that life right now. You can actually do that already. Okay, this is it. You can get paid in Bitcoin. You can get direct deposits with Fold and Lolly. You can you can take everyday expenses and convert those into you know extra Bitcoin. Um, and then you know, like I said earlier, you, you start doing additional dollar cost averaging versus spending on trinkets or habits. And what I mean by that is like, there's people that I've talked to that have been like, I quit smoking so I could so I could buy more Bitcoin, or I quit doing this so I could buy more Bitcoin, or you know, I skipped I skipped like this extravagance or whatever. And all that does is just steal you. It just you know, it just makes you stronger and makes you like really more aggro about what you're going to get for yourself. Um, it's it's very interesting to me to see how that changed because we all have that destination in mind of having a certain amount of personal net worth, and Bitcoin is the is the vehicle. I'm a car dealer. Sorry, it's a joke. It's a vehicle to get us there. Okay. It's, sometimes it takes a little longer than we want to, um, just like my punchlines. But the, th the other thing you have, if you are a business. Okay, then why not have have part of your business treasury in Bitcoin? So you know, like, why not why not go with the Chad's the Chad playbook? You know, you, your business makes money. Put ten, put five or ten percent of your profits into Bitcoin. Put put fifteen percent, whatever. You can always sell it right, if you have to. If you really need the money, you can go on at a, like three in the morning on Sunday and be like, oh crap, I got to sell like whatever amount to pay rent if you have to. Or you just do the Jedi mind trick and you say, will you accept Bitcoin in payment, right? That's a great one because you're orange pilling your landlord at that point. Are there tax efficient ways to swap into Bitcoin? Earlier, uh, the professor that was here that was with the DOJ um, tax stuff, he was talking about how there is effectively no wash trade rule, right? So in a way, as a business, one of the, the ways around that is so let's say that you know you got a little aggressive and like FOMO'd in when Bitcoin is like at 47 and you bought like a lot through your business and then Bitcoin goes down to 30. And then you sell it at 30 and buy it back at 30 and then you've effectively gone like and you've now taking you now taken a, a tax loss harvest on that. Okay, this is just these are things that you learn. Um, but eventually we're gonna be looking for hash rate exposure. We're gonna be saying, you know what? I'll take one S19. Just give me one S19 and I'll plug it in somewhere. Because that that thousand dollars a month worth of Bitcoin now, right? It's basically like if you plug an S19 in, uh, you're getting about, let's say, 0 0.02 Bitcoin per month, okay? So if you think about that, and you, everybody has this mental chart of Bitcoin with like up and to the right, and then like somebody throws another thing up there and then it keeps going, like, Whatever Bitcoin you can get now is cheaper Bitcoin than you're going to get two or three years from now, right? So if, if all you're doing is wasting some electricity, you know, according to somebody, you maybe plug one of these into your office, maybe, where you have lower, you know, and then you can use it as a text write-off. I don't know. There's creative ways of doing it, but the idea is that, you know, you need to really signal your intention and you need to take accountability. Like, it, it can do so many things for you. You just have to get creative. But you, with every every move you make to be more Bitcoin centric, you're getting more people into the Bitcoin ecosystem, and that's the important part. The more people you have in your Bitcoin ecosystem, the more people are in it, and then the NG you're, you're concerned with at that point is taking us from two percent to three percent or something. And you think on a global scale, if we go from 150 million to 200 million, or 300 million or whatever in terms of users in a short period of time, that those people coming in and, and dollar cost averaging and buying regular little bits of Bitcoin and learning how to cold, you know, pull their stuff off exchanges and things like that, that creates an effect so much greater than some Chad CEO guy like saying, oh, you know, our, our country bought this or our company bought this or whatever. On the continuum, right, Bitcoin is directly in the middle of everything. Uh, red and blue, right? We have, uh, I'm not saying that these are political parties, but I'm just saying like in our, in our current political situation, we obviously see these two sides as adversarial. In this way, I'm gonna say that on this side we have rational and logical, and on that side we have passionate and visionary, right? Bitcoin is all of those things at the same time. It's the, it's the stretch between all that stuff. And so, you know, it, you just have to figure out where you fit on the continuum, and then how to, how to put your, how to put your, daily routine or your monthly routine or whatever it is into that framework so that you can most accurately keep your Bitcoin safe along the way. Create the right spending habits and priorities um, and figure out your ideal outcome, you know, and, and you will find the right supporting actions for that. 
Okay. This is a good one. Any Smashing Pumpkins fans in there? Okay, so um, the world is a vampire. Mother Earth is a bloodsucker. Mother Earth is rough, okay? She is out there. But mostly, it's I would say maybe the world in this sense is populated by, uh, you know, competitors, populated by um, lawyers uh, and, and people that fake slip and fall accidents against you at your car dealerships, you know, things like that. Uh, not that I'm in the process of one of those things. But, you know, everything we do is a marketing trick. Everything we're experiencing is a marketing trick. Oh, bet you, bet you can't eat just one, right? Because you're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna eat one. And then, you, then, then they got you to eat one. Like, that's the thing, you know? Like, even if you win, you still lost because you've now done exactly what they want you to do. Uh, when we ha everybody is, is on a Netflix subscription or a, it's a we're, we're getting subscribed to death now. You know, we unplugged just so we could get like, like pinpricked by all these different 999s and 399s and stuff like that. So we're everywhere now, we're getting, and so you don't really realize the mess that that puts you in unless you're having to spend Bitcoin because then you're like, I don't need this stuff that bad. I have friends, I can come on my friends into like signing up for Netflix. I'll just show up there with like a burger every once in a while and I'll still get to watch my shows. It's a great idea. Um, I, I, I'm, you, I mean like if you're wealthy enough then you don't really think about the little things, but gasoline costs the same for everybody, right? Milk and hamburgers and you know, and that's and sort of like staples. You, you ever go to the grocery store and you're like, all right, here's what I'm gonna do. I've got my turkey, I've got my burgers, I got my salad. I know what you rang me up for 24.38, I'm gonna pay $18.99. What do you think about that? Take that to your boss. Like, I'm dealing in a negotiating culture constantly as a car dealer, so people are pulling that shit with me all the time. Everything has a sticker price, and no one wants to pay it, okay? No one wants to pay sticker price, but everyone has accepted the fact that when you go to In-N-Out Burger, or Five Guys, or uh, AMC, or whatever, no one goes in and says, all right, I'm a senior in high school. How's that, senior discount, what do you think? Like, it, no one negotiates the regular shit, but the regular shit is what we spend all of our money on. It's not just houses and cars and stuff like that. It's regular living, right? And what do I mean by that? Well, okay, credit card merchants, you know, a great example as a small business. Visa and Stripe, stuff like that. So, like, they're taking two to three percent of the top line revenue of every swipe. So you go to Lululemon, and you buy your $83 pants, and you're like, these are gonna make me look so good. And then you swipe, and then then Visa charges Lululemon a buck 70, okay? Lululemon doesn't get that money. So they either have to inflate their prices, or they have to have margin compression. And anybody a small business owner in here? Anybody? This is not a dox, by the way. I appreciate the Bitcoin dox, this is no one. Does anybody want to, want to volunteer for if they're gonna let their margins compress or if they're gonna pass that cost on? You wanna like just weigh in on that? Anybody wanna weigh in on that? Passing the cost on is the way it works, okay? And when the other day, Jen Pisaki said, companies aren't gonna pass these things along. They're not, they're, why would they do that? It's like, bitch, what are you talking about? <laughs> I guess they will because business owners are in business like they have liabilities they have to pay rent and pay you know all this other stuff and that stuff comes off the top line revenue so that's before you make a dollar so my car dealership like we do about 30 million dollars in, in uh, revenue on an annual basis for, just for service okay so if you think about it, everyone's paying Visa MasterCard Amex stuff like that I'm getting hammered for like 80 or 100 grand a year on that Okay, so I'm sitting here thinking, how much would it cost to rent a core dev for like four months to like program a lightning node to just do PO point of sale stuff for me? And I'm like, fuck it, that's what I'm gonna do. And that's literally what I'm doing right now. I'm building like a point of sale app uh, for my dealership selfishly because I would rather take a risk on like spending 60 grand on a core dev guy to like just kick ass and then be able to turn around and market that product and then get people like orange pilled right there. Like, hey, sign up for strike, get five bucks, right? Um, and, and if we were able to do that, like then my company saves hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars over a long enough time scale. And when you sell a business, your business is worth a multiple of what it makes in a year. So that second layer effect is that if I save 100 grand, my business is worth an extra million, you know, typically, something like that, you know? So it's like a big, it's a really big deal. Small businesses get like musted into these rails, okay? They get, they get squished into these rails. 
But Bitcoin has allowed people, like Crypto Graffiti, whose shirt I'm wearing right here, to charge people in Bitcoin so he doesn't have to deal with that shit, you know? Like if I'm gonna buy ASICs from Adam or a hash hut, like I can send him, I could theoretically send him Bitcoin and then neither, then, yeah, then neither one of us has to deal with you know, wire fees or any of this other crap. We don't have to wait in line. We just get it done. Especially if it's international, they hold it usually yeah, any international wire. Which is super right? racist. But that's it's really racist. Two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Two weeks. yeah. So, um, you know, and, then, and small businesses have the same regulatory hurdles that big ones do, except on a scale basis, it's even worse because you have to have minimum coverages. And when you're like operating, let's say, a bowling alley where you got to deal with like a slip or something like that, you know, like that could get pretty costly based on how much what the margin is for bowling pins. Um, there's a lot of different things that we look at it because you know the whole idea that I have with this is that Bitcoin and Lightning Network it really is going to benefit small business. In the next couple of years, we're going to see this really accelerate, where people are going to figure out how to integrate it the same way I'm figuring out how to integrate it. Like right now, I'm already transacting and uh, doing cars. Uh, with cryptocurrency, and if someone wants to pay me USDC or Bitcoin or whatever, I'm willing to accept that, and I'm willing to take that risk of buying it in that, and then arbing it out because I'm a degenerate day trader, um, which isn't necessarily the easiest thing for a lot of people to deal with on a on a like a, a gut basis. But you know, if you get to the point where imagine, imagine if there was a service that doesn't this doesn't exist yet. So any programmers, feel free to take this and run with them. This is your billion dollar idea. Imagine a service where you were the arb guy you know, for a company that was transacting Bitcoin. Where they, they have a certain budget that they've got to pay every month and then they, they're, but they're taking in and, and, and sending out Bitcoin and you're helping them time it to time the markets. We all know Bitcoin's volatility is high, two or three percent a day on average, right? So just imagine how much margin there is if you're doing millions of dollars of transactions and you can, you can as a business, you could end up saving one Bitcoin a year through that process. Like one Bitcoin a year, we all know where Bitcoin's going. At least I do. I, I, I believe it more than I believe in most things that I've ever believed in, that Bitcoin is going like that way. Like wham, you know, like off the chart, you know? And if Bitcoin hits $20 million one day, imagine that. Like imagine the buying power of just being crafty and getting that one extra Bitcoin a year as a big business, small business, whatever. That, that kind of like, Scooping up the crumbs mentality is how b good businesses end up staying around for a really long time. Um, and you keep, and when you do that, you keep more money in the hands of the risk-taking entrepreneur, which is the guy that's doing the heavy lifting anyways. The guy that's putting the risk out there, the gal that's putting the risk out there, whether it's a hair salon or you know a pizza place or whatever, like you want those people to succeed. You're, you're paying them for their service. You love that pizza. You just, you gotta get that pie, right? You want them to be around. It's so painful when you go to that place and it's closed because they went out of business, right? Or because they got shut down because of COVID or whatever. So we, we need to do what we can to keep those businesses we really care about. And we need to let them know. And we need to, we need to be part of that network because they're the ones that, you know, that, I mean, they're making it for us, so we need to make it for them too. Um, so just really simply, right? Whoever you're paying, you're encouraging. <laughs> and this is a go back to the Amazon thing. Like even companies that you don't like, if you're if you're paying companies that you don't like, you're you're supporting the enemy at that point. Um, whatever payment rails you use, you're advocating for. If you're paying cash for stuff, it's because you don't you're trying to like you you believe in cash, right? If you're paying in Lightning, if you're paying in Bitcoin on chain or whatever, then you're advocating for that, and then they're going to see that. It, it, like if you go to the same breakfast place and you get the same thing all the time, and you have the same waitress all the time. Eventually, as a Bitcoiner, you're going to be like, hey. I'm gonna tip you today in Bitcoin. Like you're just gonna feel that, and you're gonna see that, and you're gonna have that connection with somebody, and you're gonna get them off to a start, you know, in the Bitcoin world by getting them to sign up. And all these programs, whether it's Swan or Cash App or Lolly or everything else, it's always like, hey, you get what five bucks to sign somebody up or ten bucks to sign up or something like that. Like there's tons of businesses that are doing that, um, and that's why, and that's why, um, you know, you are picking winners, right? So the question though is, how, how much will I be willing to compromise? Like, am I willing to compromise a little bit of, you know, a little bit of like explanation every time I pay for something? Like why I want to spend, you know, using Lightning or why I don't want to spend using an Amex or why I don't want to take an Amex. If you're willing to go through a little bit of friction, that pain will actually build a better bond. In the same sense that by going to the gym, you'll, and you hit the weights a little bit, you'll buff yourself up a little. Right? or you'll hurt yourself, one of the other two. But either way, your body will have a reaction, and that's what we're trying to create. Um, and this is the big thing though, right? Bitcoin slays vampire vendors by going direct. It allows us to be 
peer to peer, right? We're all in this together, we're all humans. Uh, we don't need these big entities that are offering no value. They're offering no value to us because we have a program now that, that usurps that. In the same sense that, like, in certain places in Africa, they have only cell networks. They don't have any landlines, right? They've completely, they've completely like, whoop, just like hopped right over that, okay? They don't need landlines because they have cell technology, which is better. There's, there's, there's people in China that now drive cars, SUVs, that, like, their grandpa rode a donkey or rode a horse, you know what I mean? They skipped that. And the way the suspension technology is on cars now, you can pretty much drive on any road with a, with a decent car. You don't even need to pave road, you don't even really need roads, right? You need new roundabouts. Um, so, uh, you know, understanding the dynamics and the incentives of marketers, like I said, a lot of these companies have a direct incentive to sign you up. A company like Swan is obviously charging you a percentage when you, when you buy. It's much lower than Coinbase, and that's their incentive. How many people can they get on there, right? From an ethical standpoint, their thing is, hey, buy only, don't sell, just hold, right? That's great. So I can I can psychologically align with that, and I'm into it. Um, <laughs> this is this is kind of a stretch for a lot of people, depending on what your religious beliefs are. But a lot of us have gone out there and said that Bitcoin is the ark, right? It's going to stop us from the flood of fiat that's going to just steamroll so many people and bury them, uh, because their life's work is going to get wiped out in a in a 40 day rain, rainy season, and that's going to happen at some point. It's happened in Venezuela, it's happened in Lebanon, it's happened in, uh, it's happening in Turkey right now, it's happening in countries all over the world. It's happening in small ways with lower income people in America right now because they can't get off the bottom rung of the economic ladder, okay? They have bank fees, they have exp more expensive gas, they have all these things that are going up and like their base level of, of expense is on a percentage basis is so much higher on those things that are non-negotiable. Um, so every time we're, you know, we all believe in Bitcoin to the point that we're here showing up. So, you know, I'm just taking this leap that some of you might have Bitcoin, once again. And every time we transact Bitcoin, like the way the, the network works and the way the, the, the chain works, whether you want to call it a blockchain or a time chain, every time we do that, we're nailing, we're nailing that thing, we're making it more solid. You know, we're putting more nails in the wood that's holding the, that's holding the planks together. And, and that's what that's what's going to take us through this through this difficult stuff, okay? Um, and then the last one is freedom and financial liberty. They require accountability, right? There's no such thing as oh, I want total freedom and total autonomy, but like, oh, could you just do this for me? No, you have to take accountability and do it for yourself. That's the fucking point, okay? You really have to take accountability uh, for your money, your decisions, and if you send it to the wrong address. Should have double checked, right? If you're just going first three, last three, I know a lot of people do that because um, it's quick. You know, make sure you're only sending twenty bucks like that. The QR codes. Make sure that you're 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 looking through your networks to make sure to, to see that you're not, you know, getting spyware, malware, all this other stuff. The game will evolve. Okay, the the, the game of of we used to we used to have money in a bank, and then dudes used to ride up on horses with revolvers and go pow 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 all night, putting money in the bank. And it, they don't do that anymore, okay? Like, that's not the way it goes. Now, it's, you know, it's, it's much easier to rip off a, a decentralized exchange. Um, it's much easier to try to hack a Coinbase hot wallet with someone that doesn't have very good security protocols. So just, you know, you have to take accountability for that. On that, on that note, it's your Bitcoin, okay? It's nobody else's. Make sure it's yours. Hold it. Take it. Look at it. Smell it. Doesn't smell like anything. Uh, it's your choice, right? And it's your consequence. So everything you do has a consequence. I was talking to Svetsky earlier, who's, I don't know where he's at, but we were talking and, and, and he said, you know, earlier he said, when you take away the negative consequences for people to act, they lose, they lose the concept of how bad they're really acting. And right now, I don't think it's that big of a stretch to say, with no consequences on the, on the Treasury and the Fed the last couple of years, as we've, now we're at like, Thirty trillion dollars of national debt. The consequence really isn't there for any of them. They're, they can't even get unelected. Like Yellen and, and Powell and these people, they're not up for election in the midterms, right? They're not a governor. They're not somebody that, that we vote on. We don't vote on these people, okay? So they're just like, I think this is the right thing to do. You know what I mean? And they're just pulling levers. And you know, it is it is what it is. Um, along those lines, anybody seen uh, Dune yet? Yeah. Spoiler alert: uh, They have sandworms. Okay, that's all. Uh, so anyways, 
So up next, up next is regulating Bitcoin, and it's happening, right? We're getting these, we're get, we're getting a lot of conversation about that. Um, it's important to know that our safety is not guaranteed. Okay, Bitcoin safety is guaranteed. Bitcoin will be fine, whether whether we all get nuked or Ebola or whatever. Bitcoin will be just fine without us and without our Bitcoin. Um, so you know, right now, it's work. The SEC and Treasury are, are working on stable coins. They're really, they're really cranky about the dollar and the dollar's hegemony. Um, you have people like Sailor, you know, bless his heart, saying, Bitcoin is gonna make the dollar the reserve currency of the world. It'll be Bitcoin and dollars. That's what's happening. Did you have a Sailor, there you go. I did a Jimmy song for Spetsky earlier. Uh, so, yeah, so the SEC and, and versus XRP, that's that's the thing right now. Like, they're putting out like anti SEC videos. I saw one the other day, and it was like, it was like people that buy XRP have never even heard of Ripple. I'm like, what? What is this bullshit? But you know that. that so so we'll see what happens here because that's going to be part of the regulatory framework that comes out. And one of the things that we believe is that. Um, you know, FUD is basically propaganda, okay? So the FUD is propaganda from either Chinese interests or from, uh, you know, Malthusian people that are basically anti-human progress or uh, the Ethereum Foundation, um, right, you know, right. and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> just saying. Um, they're pretty well funded. Uh, you know, so we have to support the future by supporting Bitcoin businesses, okay? That's really important. If you wanna be a Bitcoiner, then you gotta support Bitcoin businesses. So give me, besides Swan, because we just used that word like 80 times today and they're an event sponsor, can anybody else throw a, a Bitcoin business out there? Full, Rowdy, Lolly, Unshade. Boom, okay, lots of them, thank you, there you go. Uh, Coin Tiger, right, there's another one. Um, so, you know, uh, it's important for us to support those, okay? If you don't know, like, come talk to me, I'll make you a list, I actually wrote it down. Uh, Swan River Unchained Capital, uh, let's say Riot, uh, HUD8, uh, Marathon Core, they're all mine, you know, mining people. The miners are very important too, okay? That's also that's very important. And now, because we're so fed up with what's happening with uh, A16Z and like trying to pump their bags and stuff, we decided that we need to start lobbying. And I say we collectively in a loose manner, but I also mean we as in myself. Um, we formed, um, we formed what's called the Bitcoin Today Coalition. I'm, I'm actually skipping a couple slides on myself. But um, we need to stand up for ourselves, okay? Bitcoiners, we need to stand up for Bitcoin. Uh, we need to stand up for this broker thing, the 60-50i thing. We need, to, we, need to, we need to fight to fight on those things because uh, it's, it's a big deal. Because the precedent that these things set now, it could be law for 20, 30 years. Look, I mean, Nixon took us off the gold standard as a temporary measure. 50 years, so like, I don't know where temporary fits on the temporary transitory scale, but like, 50, I'm not even, you know, like, yeah. I, I mean, the guy's dead, so obviously he's not taking us back on, and either is anybody else. Because it gives it gives the little lady with the cranky hair, it gives her a lot of power to not have a gold standard, okay? Um, here we go, here's a call to action right here. We have to starve out the enemies of Bitcoin. Okay, this is another one. Like I said about the vampires, right? Vampires sustain themselves by drinking your blood. Okay, we have to make it, I have to make it a little gothic, right? I'm going last, this is how it goes. Um, we gotta starve them out. We can't just let them suck our blood forever and think that that's gonna be okay. That's not gonna be a good result, okay? We have, we have a total addressable market, in my estimation, of approximately four billion future Bitcoiners. Okay, this is the goal. This is, this is where, I mean, at this point, obviously, that's the majority, okay? Um, you know, if we get, for us to get to this level, Okay, we're gonna have to basically make sure that they're using Bitcoin instead of other things. We have to, at some times, make toxic replies. We have to take dumps on protocols like WorldCoin, okay? That's a straight up scam, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. WorldCoin is a scam, all right? If you buy WorldCoin or Shiba Inu or anything like that, you're, you're part of the problem. And because the, if those dollars all went into Bitcoin, you know, we're going to. So if those dollars go into Bitcoin instead of something else, this is a zero sum game because people are on salaries. Most people don't get like uh, a cryptocurrency allotment from their that, from their work that they can just like sprinkle, okay? You get a fixed dollar amount or a commission and it's up to you to spend it. And once you spend it, it's gone most of the time, okay? So you can only spend it once. Um, 
Okay, a little positivity after that one. Bitcoin payments distribute prosperity, okay? Think about that for a second. Like $20 of Bitcoin today could have, it could be worth $1,000 in the future to that person that you gave it to, okay? It could have a lot of buying power. So when you're thinking about how to help people, obviously you want to educate them, and I'm talking about how to talk to no coiners right now, but like, you know, $5 to you as a Bitcoiner is probably not a lot of money, but it's a, it's a, it's a hook, and then it gives you a reason to talk to that person. And in a karmic sense, you're, you're paying it forward. You're actually teaching them something. You're gonna lead your network, and you're gonna find new ways to integrate Bitcoin into regular use cases. You know, like I said about the lunch example, you're gonna, you're gonna switch things around so instead of giving someone cash when they pay you the card, you're gonna send them cash app, and that's gonna be better. Um, you're gonna, you, you gotta promote the on-ramps and the innovators. And, you know, uh, like Svetsky and I were talking, I was on a podcast recently, and the thing that I said was, you know, the lead horses matter the most. You gotta give them the fuel, okay? They drag the whole wagon train. If you do this thing that a lot of the people right now are trying to do politically, which is like, hey, if you feel okay, two plus two could equal five. I'm sorry, no, no. Two plus two is four, okay? I don't care what color you are or anything like that, it doesn't matter, math is math, okay? There is one definable truth in the universe and that is math doesn't care any more than Bitcoin cares, what you look like, how old you are, or where you came from, okay? So we have to focus on logic, and the lead horses are running with logic, and they're innovating with that, and they're building new things, and we need to support them. We need to give them the ammunition to go out there and, and, and drag us to the future kicking and screaming. Because a lot of people like the way it is, and the way it is is not good enough. We can do a lot better as a society. And on that note, like, I mean, I can't think of anything that's happened in recent history that's inspired me as, as an adult to like do my own research or learn, dig as hard as I have into Bitcoin and, tr and think about like, you know, all of us here, if you imagine how many hours that you put into it, how many hours you spent learning and trying to learn and trying to learn and, and trying to get better and trying to help your friends and family out to understand things, you know, Bitcoin to me is like the only, is the only thing I can think of that's taking people down the self-actualization route um, on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, and it's taking you to that top priority. It really does do that, and and you're you're doing that through self education. A lot of times, it's not through it's not through a college course, or it's not through like you know ten years of study that you were forced to take. Um, and the next thing is this is called payments as a vote. Bitcoiners as a voting block. Okay, debatable on how many people are actually using Bitcoin in America, but there are millions and millions of people. Okay. And when you see an election, a presidential election, come down to, regardless of where the votes came from or whatever, what time of night they came in, uh, you know, Bitcoiners are gonna make the difference in the next presidential election, all right? Bitcoiners are gonna make the difference in, in the midterm elections, and they are sick of the bullshit, okay? The, uh, Bitcoiners are taking a stand, they're amassing political power behind the scenes, and that's why uh, myself, Jimmy Song, and a couple of other of us, uh, we started the Bitcoin Today Coalition. Our goal is to uh, orange pill uh, the Congress and the Senate. Because going back to this slide, um, I think, yeah, there you go. So back to the four billion number, I don't have access to four billion people, okay? I'd love to think that in the six degrees of separation thing, like I could come up with some viral idea and it's gonna reach everybody, it's gonna stay harmonious and, and true the whole way through, like a, like a really strong arrow, but it's, it's not likely. What's more likely is that a group like ours is gonna be able to take the couple thousand people in DC and get like 300 of them to figure it out. Okay, it really is only gonna take about two or 300, maybe 400 people in Washington DC to actually get it with Bitcoin and that will literally change the world. America is the leader of the free world for the time being. Um, and as we come at them from different angles, you know, uh, venture funding, education, we have, a, we have somebody that worked at the, in the White House, uh, small business stuff, social media stuff, you know, ladies, men, uh, people of different races and colors and, and, and political angles. We're, bar we're bipartisan and we're putting forth an education-based agenda. We're trying to give these people like stuff like this machine greens and things like that that are, that are sort of, we're just throwing it out there so they can take it and they can do their own research at that point. It's been really successful so far. Uh, if you guys have seen what Ted Cruz has been doing recently, like we were on a Zoom with him a couple months ago and all of a sudden he literally is installed, he wants to 
He wants to install Bitcoin ATMs and, and Bitcoin point of sale devices in the Capitol, in the freaking building, okay? So he wants it to be like, oh, you want your Reese's peanut butter cup, you go boop boop, and then lightning skin, and then 88 cents, there you go. Um, we've come a long way in a very short period of time, and it's because as Bitcoin is hitting all-time highs, it's attracting a lot of attention, good and bad, from everybody. Uh, but right now, we're interacting weekly with the Senate and the House offices, as well as governors. So we're looking for people that want to help us with different localities, uh, because we're only a couple people, a couple dozen people. Um, and then by the time midterms come around, we're going to be pursuing a super PAC to uh, promote Bitcoin-friendly candidates, because I think we can all agree that We'd rather have a Bitcoin-friendly candidate, right? And then I personally, as with as a voter, you know, I'm going to vote for the Bitcoin candidate. I'm willing to make that the number one thing for me. I'm at the point where I've got I've got a small business and I've got kids, and I know that the kind of consumer vendor protections I have as a business owner are sort of not going to change too much. Um, taxes are always going to be sort of crappy, but Bitcoin has a has a chance to go 20x, and my house does not. So what do I care? You know, I need to protect what's going to be my future, which is Bitcoin, and um, you know, I think that's really important. So lastly, uh, you know, this is an original quote, so you know I didn't get this from anybody else. But by planting the seeds of success, we're, we we manifest the future, and today's plan invests in tomorrow's victory. So that's what it is. We were planning today, we, the plans that you make today ensure that you have a chance to win tomorrow. Uh, and if anybody you know, has ever had to get in a fight and they knew when the fight was gonna happen, it's always better than just being ambushed, right? So we, need, we, we have a date set, it's 2022, right? That's the first fight, that's the midterm elections. Um, we have the mayor of New York City just said he's gonna take payments in Bitcoin, right? The mayor of Tampa is gonna take payments in Bitcoin. Uh, Suarez is already sort of there, so we can't take credit for that. But the point is that, you know, as this goes out there, we just keep pushing this. Every, it's up to all of us to push it, and anybody can push it. Anybody can, just has to retweet things and engage with these things. So when you see Warren Davidson with a super based take on Bitcoin or the financial situation, give him a like, give him a follow, give him a retweet. You know, he's a super gnarly Bitcoin congressman. Um, you don't have to live in Ohio to be exposed to that. He's fighting for us on the on the Senate or the, the House Banking Committee. Um, so anyways, you can follow me at Straight Edge Racer. Uh, you can follow us at BTC underscore coalition. And uh, that's it. I'm open for questions. All right. Oh, there we go. Um, oh, everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, with the coalition thing at the end, so there's. Um, group in Australia, they put together like the Bitcoin Industry Association or some shit, whatever it was called in there. They, they originally asked me to be a part of it, and I was like, yeah, nah, I don't know, uh, I can't be really bothered. Um, because I've always sort of, you know, which side of the table I sit on. But um, we, we ended up having a discussion afterwards, and there's a there's an OG Bitcoiner in Australia that I really respect. He's, he's quite quiet on Twitter, but you know, me and him sort of go back a little while. And one thing he mentioned that we understand the nuance a little bit better, and this might help you guys on, on the journey with it, is um, the, the industry body, that's what it's called, the Bitcoin industry body, BIM, um, is more about being a voice for Bitcoin businesses, not for Bitcoin. Because, like, what, what we kind of, the, the nuance or the, the, the needle that we threaded there was the idea that the, the shitcoin companies, um, you know, and the shitcoiners and everything, that they all sort of fall in the same category. That they're all kind of like behaving like companies. Bitcoin doesn't really need representation. Bitcoin's going to do a thing. Agreed. You know, I agree. But Bitcoin businesses, the ones that actually enable access, usage, accumulation, mining, whatever, it doesn't hurt for that to have representatives or a voice or a body to, to speak to. So I think maybe just like my fucking two sets, one set, half a set, um, would be maybe the, the, the coalition process is less about like educating on Bitcoin more. I mean, I guess that has to come as a prerequisite, but really being a representative of Bitcoin is that that's what we need. That's fair. So let me just let me use that as an example, okay? So so currently right now, one of the reasons why Texas is like so on a government level invested in Bitcoin is because of these big structures that are being built, like the Winstone Foundation, 
or the Windstone facility, I should say. It's gonna be like 200 megawatts, is that correct? Something like that? Far beyond that. Okay, far beyond 200 megawatts, which if you wanna calculate that out, that's a lot of basics, okay? So the amount of money that these companies are investing in, in order to mine and distribute Bitcoin and you know all this other stuff, I mean, Bitcoin is, most Bitcoin businesses, let's face it, are very honest businesses. They have to be, because Bitcoiners are really hard to deal with. You know, we're very demanding, right? So when you have, um, you have a mining company that's gonna invest 20, 40, 100 million dollars into a place that was basically decrepit, you know, like a city that was just crumbling apart, you have people like Ted Cruz and Senator Cornyn and Greg Abbott are like, that's awesome because they're they're basically bringing jobs back. So it's a, so like when, when Parker and I talk about it, I talk to Parker Lewis about this a lot, and he says, listen, the, the key is, he, he's all about incentives, right? What are the incentives? Now, if you get the, the senator or the congressman themselves to be a Bitcoiner, right? And to say that, hey, Bitcoin can help set you up, or it can help their state to be more competitive, or their district to be more competitive, that incentive alignment is the sort of on the education side of it. But then on the on, on in terms of like who we're looking for as donors and things like that, yes, we're definitely looking for the Bitcoin companies to be there to help them represent their, their brand and help them, you know, from a municipal basis. Because the energy FUD is still very real from the left side right now, and we're trying to help dispel that. And so we actually have different decks that we give to like different states depending on this is an oil producing state or a wind state or a water state or a nuclear state. You know, this is a state that needs more high tech jobs where they have good high tech universities. So we're trying to kind of get all those things together. But really put it out there for all the states because at the end of the day, the interesting thing in America about the Senate versus the House, in, in the Senate, every state has two senators, right? So it doesn't matter how big a state is, they only get two senators. So on, on a vote standpoint, you know, if you get enough senators, then they can basically block anything from happening. They can block any bad legislation. They can put their foot down, and if like 10 or 15 of them do a breakaway, then like you can never get a consensus. And that's really important because Bitcoin, the network, Bitcoin, the asset, is gonna continue to do the, the little wobbly snake dance up the hill, okay? And, and, and there's nothing that we can do to affect that, you know, and nothing we need to do to affect that. That's gonna happen anyways. But the people that are along for the ride can be targeted, you know, through IRS measures and stuff like that. So what we're trying to do is educate these people so that they don't make laws that are number one unenforceable and stupid. But like almost in a way, if we slow down any law from passing, if we block anything, if we can just hold the dam, the, the thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it like this, like we're pushing on the dam, you know, of the, the yelling and the, the Powells and all these people, we're like trying to hold that back. And then the plebs are amassing behind us. We just need to hold the line long enough until Gandalf can come over the hill with the million dollar Bitcoin, you know what I mean? And then everyone gets slain. All the works die at that you know, that's what happens. But it's, but it's a good point that we bring up. Because yeah, Bitcoin doesn't need us, but we feel like we we're getting zero representation from, from, these other, from these other, you know, industry bodies or whatever because they're crypto bodies, which are like, hey, like somebody said that like, so one of our, our affiliates or whatever uh, board members was in, DC, and somebody was like, hey, why don't you just, why don't you guys just get Bitcoin to like switch over to proof of stake? And she was like, ah, oh, hell nah, you know what I mean? Because that's literally what they, that's how far off they are in their understanding for Bitcoin itself. They just think, they think that that, number one, they think proof of stake is good, which by the way, that's fiat, that's stupid. But you know, that's so, there is a lot of like, bashing over the head that needs to happen with some people, and like massaging the back with other people. And we were we trying to use, some pretty big data to kind of crawl through to figure out who we, who we have to go, which is why we need different types of representation. You know? so, <clears throat> there's a lot of technical hindrances. We discussed this in one of the uh, talks earlier, but um, all the hindrances that we have to get people in action doing things, I, I think the greatest, and I want to get your feedback on this, I think our greatest hindrance is the communication. Just like the mass media doesn't want to communicate certain things that aren't, that doesn't make them look good, or they're in control of uh, by corporations that don't want to look bad, so this is control of it. Same thing with the, you know, the traditional market that has lots of writers writing all kinds of things to get people to say, oh, it's a, it's a terrible time, now. let's sell, but they're actually trying to buy. Yeah. You know, so. Mark, like manipulation, you're saying. I mean, would you say that it's 90? 1% or 40% of this communication problem with the world 
about the simple things like Bitcoin is going up like this when you look at the whole chart as opposed to, oh, it was dropped all this way. Oh, yeah, when it's, it's funny. Down about everything. Yeah, I mean, anybody that bought Bitcoin below $10,000, when they read a headline like, Bitcoin crashes to 60 grand. It's like there's a meme, somebody put out a meme video and it's like Tom Cruise dancing from Tropic Thunder, you know? And he's like, you know, and he's like, yeah, oh, hey, crash to 60 all you want, that's great. Because eventually it'll crash to 80, right? And eventually it'll crash to 250 and it'll just keep doing that. But there's always going to be enemies of Bitcoin. And the thing is that a lot of these reporters, specifically, I'm using like journalistic, you know, elements in this, in this uh, example. They're very salty because they heard about Bitcoin when it, in 2012 and they did not buy. So the whole like unbiased opinion because I don't own anything is like the biggest load of shit ever. Because there's no there's no substitute for that 58 pound salt pile on your table, right? If you could have bought it at under a thousand, now it's at sixty thousand, right? Like that's just like that breaks people in half sometimes. And like uh, recently, Natalie interviewed Peter Schiff and got him to admit that he thinks it is going to hit a million dollars at some point, right, or something like that. Or he said something he said like that. Could, yeah. He said it could. Peter Schiff said it could hit a million dollars. This is the guy that's been like the the bellwether for like Bitcoin sucks for so many times. And maybe she just hypnotized him. I don't know what it was. But the thing is that even people that have been hating on it forever, they cannot deny that it hasn't been killed yet. China, which is, as we all know, is kind of a, you know, they've got a pretty good history of killing things and people. Um, they've, they've done a really good job of trying to kill Bitcoin and a terrible job of actually killing it, right? The only thing they've succeeded with right now is booting a bunch of hash rate out of China, but they haven't killed it. It's still happening there. There's still some dude that's like, you know, got his mind going or whatever. Like, still a guy that's like petting it. He's got, he's, he, he has it sitting in a doghouse or something like that. Like, he's got it all tricked out. Like, that's still happening. So, the FUD will never stop until, unless Bitcoin got so regulated that it like became, and it became the reserve currency of the world. But at that point, you know, the, the effort level, like, the, it wouldn't make, it wouldn't align. It's just like a 51% attack on the network. Well, that's what I'm saying. But, but the you, point is, what, what, is that, that so, is the major problem, and if we focus efforts on that, well, yeah, we're going to erase a lot of the other problems. Because, I mean, the focus should be on competition. That should be the advantage that it has. Right. And then all of a sudden, everything like fits in its place. Correct. But here's the thing, though, right? Think about how many industries this literally breaks the back of, right? You don't need a financial advisor, really, if you're, if you're a good Bitcoiner on your own because you're just gonna keep hodling it and you're gonna figure out ways to take loans and stuff so you don't have to sell. And then once it goes up to a certain point, you've just absolutely crushed that arbitrage rate, which is gonna always outperform an 8% kegger from like, you know, like your guy at Schwab or something like that. That's just reality. So there's a lot of people that are disincentivized to, to actually learn about Bitcoin because their salary depends on them not understanding it. Like literally, okay? And that's something that when you go on national TV and you have people saying that, they have to say it in a manner that's you know, not super divisive. It has to be. It has to be sort of like the Jedi mind trick. It can't be like, oh, you don't get it. Have fun, stay poor. You know, but that's what happens, and that's that's the problem. Is that you have too many people that are that are pre-triggered that are just waiting to dunk on people, and that and you can't keep putting. We can't keep putting those people on CNBC to talk about it because that's where we're losing that that fight in that in the narrative. But the, the narrative. It will at some point be that Bitcoin's savings and Bitcoin's you know ability because of pieces like this, pieces like this with the the, the 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 swan piece that did not exist years ago. That's brand new. That's literally like what like two weeks or something like that. So that is happening. Companies like Swan are investing heavily in content to produce that. That's why they're hiring content people to do you know more stuff. The issue with Bitcoin in general right now is everybody's a content producer, right? Like I've got a podcast, I've got a blog, I'm on someone else, you know, like everybody's a DJ, right? Yeah. So until we consolidate that a little bit and then sort of have like maybe even our own network or our own ranking system or something like that, which is, is there, there is actually like some stuff behind the scenes and it's, it's pressing that you ask about this, but there will be like eventually a sort of a Bitcoin type TV show coming out or something like that. Like Lauren is working on a, a Bitcoin documentary. These things are happening because the incentive to do it is there. The interest is high enough to actually execute it now. The, I, it's always been a great story. It's always it's always been a cool technology, but there hasn't been critical mass yet. So, but once we get to the point that there's 180, 250 million people, something like that, we just keep TikToking and, and, and going up that, you know, spinning those numbers, then there will be enough of an, of an audience to support those, those things. Yes, CJ, thank you so much for the insight. I appreciate all of that you're doing here. I just wanted to get to a part question. 
Uh, one was, uh, what were the mediums, resources, and companies that we should point to for businesses, as well as politicians, uh, to be accepting Bitcoin? So if I had a direct line access to Rand Paul, per se, or Glenn Jacobs, or Tulsi Gabbard, when I go to them and I talk to them and say, hey, you should be utilizing Bitcoin for some of your you know, do donations or something, should I point to Swan? Should I point to... What are some of these other resources that I should point to? Yeah, so we're, we're, yeah, we're actually making like a PDF right now that's sort of like a, a workbook so that they, so I think the hard, the hard thing is people that have been in Bitcoin for a while, they have so much information, right? It is so hard to get somebody up to speed in like a lunch or a weekend or whatever. And we typically don't even get that kind of exclusivity with these people that, that, that need it. So the goal is to give them a worksheet, a workbook, it's got links, it's got videos and podcasts, and you let them kind of go down the rabbit hole. So we give them like, hey, we, yeah, we give them basically like, I call it the canon, right? We give them a little bit of canon. So we say, read this essay, you know, read this Tomer essay, this GGS essay, listen to Parker talk about this, here's Jimmy's book. You know, we go through these different things. Um, so what we're gonna do once we get our website live is we're actually gonna have that as a resource kit, and we're gonna have a sort of like an orange pill first aid kit. You know, if you imagine. So, yeah. uh, but if you can get me with Rand Paul, I love him. He's great. Uh, I mean, Ron Paul was in Bitcoin 21, and he killed it. He couldn't get him off the stage. I did. I did. It's happening. Like, like, in 2012, I've um, got direct lines. So. Got it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, I uh, wanted to ask you about if you're familiar with Big Cloud at all. Uh, I have not participated in that. <laughs> I, I don't advise anybody. You talk about a ranking system. Have you guys heard of Bitcoin? <laughs> Carlos Matos coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York, USA. Later. I'll talk about a ranking system for content creators, and that's that's essentially what BitCloud is. It allows anyone to, to create their own coin for the brand for, for their content creation. But does there need to be a coin for that though, or could we just vote those people up on Sphinx, or, you know, in Sphinx chat or something like that, or can we tip them using Lightning Bot on Telegram? That's really the issue that like the maximalists such as myself have with BitCloud specifically. Uh, we just we view BitCloud as a one-way trade where you're giving up your Bitcoin to get in, and, and so that's the issue. But I think I think you know it, you it's hard because there's a lot there's. There's very few people in the space relative to other spaces, right? Like relative to the to the Hollywood space, right? There's very few like actors, and so Bitcoin has this antagonistic uh, characteristic with the Hornets towards people that that seek attention because we believe in proof of work. We want to see someone actually execute a, a killer essay or whatever, and we're willing to lift those things up. We're willing to buy the fiat standard, the Bitcoin standard. We're willing to we're willing to listen to Safedine. You know, or, or Nick with layered money or whatever. I'm sorry if I'm first naming all this stuff. It's just it's I don't want to mispronounce any last names. I'm just going fast. But but it is important for us to lift those those people up. And then also like you know buy an extra copy of those books every once in a while and send it out as a gift. A couple years ago when I was like I think I was in double A. I was like 23 years old and I had just read The Power of Now. My entire family I was like here you go, here you go, here you go. Like I forced everybody to read it. And if they didn't read it, like fuck them, you know what I mean? But at least I made the effort. That was, that was Christmas. That was Christmas 2003, you know what I mean? Like you, this is what you get. You will, you know, make yourself better or, or you know, stop it. I'm not gonna get you, I'm not gonna get you a gift certificate to, to Home Depot, you know, so. Thank you. What, uh, what's your thoughts, very good insights. Um, what is your thoughts like on maybe to speak to Alexa and concern about a group? Like the idea of Bitcoin is being decentralized. You're talking about like lifting up voices, a lot of people are anons, or Great, even yeah. as your big in your like BTC advocacy group, like a centralized group that gets too big and then you can co opt to be your course. Like do you think guys consider that like a size you're targeting? Well let me uh, let me just clarify a couple things, right? So number one, uh, I'm not anonymous. And I, I was I was a wealthy person before Bitcoin, right? I was a baseball guy that had a had a following, and then I had been doing the car dealership thing for a long time. So like I, I was already exposed and out there. So when when we started talking about this, my thought process was let's leave anybody that wants to stay in the dark in the dark. And that's why we formed a 501c4, which means that anybody can contribute and it's anonymous. So if someone says, hey, kick ass, this is what I want you guys to go talk about. Here's some intros to these people. 
here's like some cash to go get some flights and hotels and, and throw a happy hour at the Dubliner in, in DC, which is like a Republican stronghold bar, then like go do it, right? Don't out me, right? Like if American Hollow goes, hey, here's some cash, I'm not gonna tell anybody what his name is. You know what I mean? Like that's not part of the gig. Like we don't sell anybody out, that's not how it works. But I can say that I, I'm already a public entity, so I'm, I'm fine dealing with whatever, whatever the slings and arrows that they, that they send at me. Because I've already dealt with it. I've already pitched in the World Series and All-Star Games and been booed in Yankee Stadium. Like, you can't fucking touch me at this point. Like, go ahead. Like, cross-examine me on this example, I don't care. You know what I mean? Jimmy Song, for instance, he's an author. He's written a bunch of books. He's not hiding. He's got a podcast, right? So when you have people like him and I that are willing to put ourselves out there, it's, it, and once again, it's not for Bitcoin that Bitcoin needs help because it's going to do its thing. It's for Bitcoiners that could be potentially targets. We're trying to protect them, you know what I mean, from undue civil action or you know, municipal access or companies like Riot that are like employing hundreds of people to build these things to secure our money for the future, you know? So, but that is definitely a concern, which is why it's like the people that we have in it are, are, are like, it's very, very, clear on, on the ethics to, that you have to have to, you have to like pass the smell test, right? Does that make sense? So, I mean, that's that's the goal. So, but we're, we're transparent. We, we also incorporated in Wyoming because we feel like Wyoming is like, you know, the, the first actor in the space. And, and Lummis' office has been fantastic to deal with and stuff like that. But it's been, it's, it's something that's new. I'm not a politician. I'm not, I don't have a desire to necessarily run for office. That's not my goal. But I do have a desire to like, help people that want to run for office if they want to help push our agenda. And I don't think there's, we have to look, we have to be able to play that game. That's, that's the reality. Right. Just a couple of comments before we um, completely wrap up. I loved your impression of Michael Saylor. And I'm just gonna say something because when you referred to like holding the dam back, so Sailor's actually being very strategic. I won't say how I know this, but um, we don't want to threaten the US dollar while a bunch of politicians are uneducated about Bitcoin, right? So like all of his statements are pretty pretty strategic, right? This is friendly, everybody's got the dollar. It can be the brother-sister pair for Bitcoin, so. Yeah, I just want to, yeah. on that note, on that note, I think that some of the narrative that's been happening in Bitcoin for the last couple of years has been very like, uh, I, I hate to say this word because it sounds like negative, but from an anarchist standpoint or an anarcho-capitalist standpoint or whatever, that like, you know, let's segregate and do all this other stuff. Well, like, China's not going to let us get away with that forever because if we do break everything down and just go to like, you know, plebs chasing around their own cows and stuff like that, and citadels, they will bomb us and take all of our shit, just FYI. They were, the, China's not disbanding the military at any point, so we do need the power of the US government, but if we can just like Houdini them in the meantime, yeah. and just kind of like, hey, it's fine. Yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, don't, don't mind me. Don't mind me. And then, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The dollar's not in danger, but um, so I hope if, if there's one thing you took away from all of this today, it's that capitalists create easy times, easy times create socialists, Socials, socialists create hard times, hard times create capitalists, capitalists created Bitcoin, and that's why we're here. Super excited. All right. So, we had a special guest here who had to leave, but Taylor Burks is running for the 4th Congressional District in Missouri. He's Bitcoin friendly. You can donate to his campaign in Bitcoin. Um, so you can't say hi to him because he had to leave, but you can chat with Ethan, right? If you want to um, talk about that campaign. So you all have two drink tickets to use at the bar in your orange bags for happy hour. You can head there now for drinks, bowling, bocce ball. Thank you guys so much. Thank you again to give it up for Kansas City Bitcoin Meetup. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your trip, or if you are local, thanks for having us. <laughs>